Hi everyone, I'm Shelly and you're watching There's No Place Like Home. I'm back for another Question the Narrative video. I know that I haven't done one for a while. As I mentioned in the, the latest video that I did, I've been extremely busy and haven't had nearly enough time to do all of the research and reading that I would like to. So I wanna thank everyone who has sent me emails, giving me different tidbits of information about different topics, and I am putting them all in the work folder of my email. But at this point in time, I have not been able to go through anything. So if I haven't answered you, it's not because I'm ignoring you or don't care. It's just because I have not been able to read through the emails. I have gotten pretty many of them. And today's video is actually probably going to be a quick one just because I haven't really had a whole lot of time to delve really deeply into anything. But I ran across an article in our local news right here that really got me thinking. It says leaders of Schoolkill County Borough trying to find ways to prevent flooding after suffering damage in 2018. I'm going to start out, though, just by talking again about the raising of Chicago. And I've discussed this in some other videos, the fact that um, Center City Chicago was actually supposedly raised up. The entire city was raised up a level. And, you know, I've mentioned how this seems to me to not be very feasible when you start to think about how they would raise an entire city, where they would get all of the dirt um, from to, to fill it. And I know that there are some theories about how there were huge hills and they used hoses to sluice the dirt down the hill and that's how they got all of the dirt into the city. But the fact is, is that it's not just Chicago that was raised. Um, we have Seattle that was also raised. We have Eureka Springs that was raised. I could go through city after city and raising cities in the 19th century seems like it was a pretty common practice and it almost seems like they didn't think anything of it. And I think I find that highly suspect. Um, let's just read a little bit about the raising of Chicago. And yes, I do have a point. That's where I'm gonna be getting back to the article, the first article that I showed you. But during the 1850s and 1860s, engineers carried out a piecemeal raising of the level of central Chicago. Streets, sidewalks, and buildings were physically raised on jack screws. The work was funded by private property owners and public funds. So in the 1850s and 60s, they were able to raise an entire level of central Chicago by using jack screws. During the 19th century, the elevation of the Chicago area was little higher than the shoreline of Lake Michigan. So for many years, there was little or no naturally occurring drainage from the city surface. The lack of drainage caused unpleasant living conditions and standing water harbored pathogens that caused numerous epidemics, including typhoid fever and dysentery, which blighted Chicago six years in a row, culminating in the 1854 outbreak of cholera that killed 6% of the city's population. The crisis forced the city's engineers and aldermen to take the drainage problem seriously, and after many heated discussions and following at least one false start, a solution eventually materialized. In 1856, engineer Ellis S. Chesbro drafted a plan for the installation of a citywide sewerage system and submitted it to the Common Council, which adopted the plan. And that is actually something that you do hear a lot about when we mention mud flooded buildings, like I've mentioned in many of my other videos. Um, one, one explanation that people have is that they, they, that was when they installed the sewerage system. And that's why there are so many old buildings with, with half or completely buried windows. So anyway, workers then laid drains, covered and refinished roads and sidewalks with several feet of soil and raised most buildings to the new grade. And you know, when you're looking at these things, um, just by reading them, you think to yourself, okay, that, that's possible. So here we have a rendering and it's, it's showing the, the, how the city was being raised. And we have this one here. This is when they were raising the Briggs House, a brick hotel in 1866, and that's when they were using jack screws. And as you can see, at least from this rendering, people were, looks like people are right in the balcony while they are raising it. Oh, you see people looking out the window. So that's, that's interesting. Um, but my question is, how did they do this? So they weren't just raising one building. They raised the entire center city part of Chicago and Seattle. 
and Eureka Springs and any other number of cities that you could Google and just find, you know, it, that, that not even just in America, I'm sure that it happened in other places as well. How did they do it with horses and buggies? Where did all the soil come from? Imagine excavating everything. Imagine the manpower that this took. Imagine the time that this took. And so many people just look at these explanations and, and don't think about that. They think, okay, well, Wikipedia says that this is what happened, so this must be what happened. But we have got to get out of this rut of just constantly just believing what we're reading in front of us. Whether it's on Wikipedia, no matter where it's coming from, we've got to start using our, our common sense and we need to start thinking to ourselves, okay, in theory, this story sounds feasible, but how could this actually be accomplished with the technology that they had at the time? That is really where a lot of my questions come from. So um, we'll just read right here. In 1860, a consortium of no fewer than six engineers um, co-managed a project to raise half a city block on Lake Street. This was a solid masonry row of shops, offices, printeries, long comprising brick and stone buildings, some four stories high, some five having a footprint taking up almost one acre of space and an, esti and an estimated all-in weight, including hanging sidewalks of 35,000 tons. Businesses operating in these premises were not closed down during the operation as the buildings were being raised. People came, went, shopped, and worked in them as they would ordinarily do. So this was such an easy, nonchalant kind of deal that people were able to just be walking in and out of these buildings as they were supposedly being raised up. And so many people just look at that and think, oh, that's neat. And they don't think, how is that possible? So in five days, the entire assembly was elevated four feet, eight inches by a team consisting of 600 men using 6,000 jack screws ready for new foundation walls to be built underneath. The spectacle drew crowds of thousands who were on the final day permitted to walk at the old ground level among the jacks. So, and, and it tells you how all of these different buildings were built sorry, not built, raised. Um, here, actually, we'll just read this one, hydraulic raising of the Franklin House. There is evidence in primary document sources that at least one building in Chicago, the Franklin House on Franklin Street, was raised hydraulically by the engineer John C. Lane. Californian engineers had been using hydraulic jacks to raise brick buildings in and around San Francisco as early as 1853. So there you go, we have another place, San Francisco. They were also supposedly raising up all of these cities, like it was nothing. Again, it, it seems like it was almost a, a common thing. And if you look here on the one about the Seattle underground, um, after the, the fire, the Seattle fire, they decided that they needed to raise the buildings anyway if they were going to um, reestablish the city. And what it actually tells you is that people were still shopping in both the lower level and the upper level, and they were actually walking up and down ladders while all of this was going on. So let, we'll just read a little bit about Seattle. After the great Seattle fire of June 6, 1889, new construction was required to be of masonry and the town streets were regraded one to two stories higher. One interesting thing that I pointed out in another video is that it says that the reason that the old buildings burned down was because they were made of wood. But when you actually look at pictures of the underground Seattle, they were brick. What they, what they are at least showing in the tour is brick buildings, not wood buildings, wooden buildings. Anyway, um, Pioneer Square had originally been built mostly on filled in tide lands and often flooded. The new street level also kept sewers draining into Elliott Bay from backing up at high tide. For the regrade, the streets were lined with concrete walls that formed narrow alleyways between the walls and the buildings on both sides of the street with a wide alley where the street was. Now, this is where the, the explanation of the hills and the dirt from the hills being used to supposedly fill in the streets of entire cities. So the naturally steep hillsides were used and through a series of sluices, material was washed into the wide alleys by raising the streets to the desired new level, generally 12 feet higher than before, in some places nearly 30 feet. So again, this is something that when you look at it on the surface, it thinks you think to yourself, okay, well, that makes sense. But really think to yourself, they're 
sluicing this material down the hillsides and it's being washed into these alleys. Imagine directing where this, this dirt is, is going and just think to yourself how dirt piles up as it's moving. I cannot for the life of me even imagine being able to direct all of this dirt from all of these hills all over a city to exactly where you needed it to go. It certainly doesn't seem like an easy task, yet from the number of cities that have th that claim to have raised their cities up, you would think that it was, you know, just a piece of cake to do these things. Think about this. Anyway, at first pedestrians climbed ladders to go between street level and the sidewalks in front of the building entrances. So they climbed ladders to go between street level and the sidewalks. So they're shopping and they're going back and forth on ladders. And you know, as someone mentioned in a comment, you know, uh, several months ago, imagine how the women of these days dressed with their long dresses, very formal, climbing up and down ladders with these shopping bags in their hands. It, Again, that's just one of those things that when you read it, you think, oh, that's cool. But when you actually think about it, you're like, wait a minute. Anyway, brick archways were constructed next to the road surface above the submerged sidewalks. Pavement lights were installed over the gap from the Ray Street and the building, creating the area now called the Seattle Underground. So again, the, the point, the reason that I am bringing all of this up, um, and it's probably a little late to explain this if you're new to my channel, but... The, un the, the raising of the cities is an explanation that we hear a lot for why so many cities, especially in the U.S., are underground. Um, and there is speculation that there was some sort of a mud flood, some sort of maybe earthquake possibly that buried things, soil liquefaction. It could be so many different ideas, but we keep getting told that it's just, oh, it, they, they just raised the cities. That, that's all that it was. And... It, it sounds like a really neat story, but when you actually think about the logistics of it, how would that even happen, especially in that time period with the technology that they had? And here we have also in Eureka Springs. And I know I always mention these three, but we're getting to the reason for this. I came across this article. Leaders of Schoolkill County Borough trying to find ways to prevent flooding after suffering damage in 2018. So the whole point of raising the city of Chicago and Seattle and Eureka Springs and probably San Francisco and many others was they wanted to prevent flooding. And this was done in the 19th century where they did not have even close to the technology or excavating equipment that we have today. And yet they did it like it was nothing. But here we have in 2021, they're trying to figure out how to prevent flooding. And so let's see what they came up with. And I also found it interesting. This is in Tremont, Pennsylvania. And one of the buildings that was raised in, um, was it Chicago? Yeah, it was the Tremont house. I'm not saying there's any connection at all. I just found that interesting. So we have the Tremont house, and this is Tremont, Pennsylvania. But it says, every time it rains, residents along a stretch of Spring Street in Tremont, Schoolkill County, say they look out their winds, windows and worry. In the past, the Good Spring Creek has done some major flood damage to homes. The last big flood in 2018 took out a bridge and the American Legion building. So pretty, pretty bad flooding. Since then, the borough has been dredging the creek, but recently came up with a plan to widen it. Borough leaders say FEMA estimated the cost at roughly $350,000, but when the bid came back, the price tag was $2.9 million, way more than Tremont could afford to pay. So now we have the engineer looking at a different perspective of what we can do, maybe just a portion of it to try to widen the, that creek at, at some point. Residents say a plan to fix the flooding issue couldn't come soon enough. Um, and she says she's worried about a repeat of the 2018 flood that severely damaged the first floor of her parents' home. So money is an issue for everybody who lives along here. We had to replace the whole first floor of the house after 2018. New appliances, furniture, walls, everything, Hunsinger said. And my first thought was, well, if this town... If, if the first floor of these buildings is, is getting, you know, ruined by all of the flooding that they keep having, and it's 2021, and we've got all of this equipment now that they didn't have in the 19th century, 
Why was raising the city not brought up? What happened to that? If it was so simple for the people in the 19th century to just decide that they were just going to raise the cities up a level because of flooding, why is it that 2021, so September 23rd, 2021, this is written, why is it that in 2021, somehow that doesn't even come to anyone's mind to, to raise the, the city a level? So I thought to myself, okay, well, maybe it's because the city itself is, is too large. So I looked up Tremont, Pennsylvania, just to see how big it is. And um, I know that it, yeah, it's 0.8 square miles. That's all right here. So Tremont, Pennsylvania is 0 0.8 square miles. So 2.0 square kilometers. Why was raising the city not even considered then? Why is it that something that happened in 19th century very easily to so many other places that they could just do, you know, at the drop of a hat doesn't even come up. All they can think about is widening the Creek. In the meantime, all of these houses are suffering damage on their first floors yet not a word about raising the city. Is it because they know that raising the cities is an impossible task and they know that they probably would never be able to do it? That's all that I have for you today. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed yet and would like to hear more of what I have to say, I would love if you would do that. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave one either here or over on Instagram. And if you like my work and would like to check out my Patreon page, I will leave a link in the description box for that as well. And I hope you have a great day.